Nexa front lawn for a book launch of Every Vote Counts, the story of elections in India. The book is written by Naveen Chavla. He'll appear in conversation with N. Ram. Naveen Chavla has had a ringside view of Indian elections. As chief election commissioner, he supervised the landmark 2009 general election and several key state elections as well. Every Vote Counts, the book to be launched this afternoon, presents a riveting account of how the daunting task of conducting the largest electoral exercise in the world is undertaken. And Naveen Chavla is also a biographer of Mother Teresa. He'll appear in conversation with Enram, chairman of the Hindu publishing group and former editor-in-chief of The Hindu, a political journalist, he has written on a range of socio-political subjects. And this session is brought to you by Bank of Baroda. Please join me in inviting to the stage author Naveen Chavla for Every Vote Counts and N. Ram. And to launch the proceedings, I'd like to invite Udayan Mitra, publisher from HarperCollins, to say a few words. Please join me in inviting, in inviting Udayan Mitra to the podium. It's a great moment of pleasure and privilege for us to be launching Mr. Navin Chawla's new book here at JLF. And, um, we will be unveiling the, the first copy in, in, a, in a minute. And also great privilege to have Mr. N. Ram here today in conversation uh, with Mr. Chawla. Couldn't think of a better person to be launching the book. Uh, we at HarperCollins are immensely privileged to be publishing Every Vote Counts. Um, this is election year, as you know. And uh, Mr. Chawla brings to the book his immense experience with the uh, electoral mechanism over the years. He, he was, as you know, chief election commissioner, conducted the landmark 2009 uh, general elections. And as, as, the, uh, as the 2019 general elections, which are around the corner as we start preparing for them, there are many lessons to be learned from uh, Mr. Chowda's experiences in the book. Um, we had we learned a lot in the process of uh, editing and publishing the book. And uh, we also, it was a moment of great enjoy, uh, it, it was a process of great enjoyment for us. And uh, it's a moment of great joy for us today that we are launching the book. I, I hope that you will all read the book um, and uh, enjoy it as much as we like to publish it. Uh, I would like to invite on stage our CEO, Mr. Anand Padmanavan for the formal launch of the, of the book, please. Good afternoon. The Indian elections are usually considered one of the wonders of the world, the positive and the negative, but overall as an effort, I think you'll, you'll find it difficult to 
match it, find any examples that match it in other parts of the world. Uh, first, uh, the sheer number. So what is your estimate, Naveen, of um, the, elec the electorate as we come up to the 2019 general election? Well, when I did the 2009, it was 714 million registered voters. When we came to 2014, it was 816 million registered voters. Registered voters, all of you. And now I think it's going to be 900 million, I think. Maybe as many as that. And what kind of voter turnout do you expect? You know, our, vote, our voter turnout is usually, um, for a general election, very good. Um, it's been uh, averaging between 60 and 65 percent. And when I say very good, you can compare that with Britain, which is 50 percent. But yes, when we go into uh, assembly elections, uh, say Nagaland could reach 90%. So I'd say that if all of you vote and all of you make uh, 10 other people vote, then I think we might even reach 70%. Naveen Chawla was uh, Chief Election Commissioner of the Election Commission of India for a very, uh, during a very important period, above all the 2009 uh, general election or Lok Sabha election also several assembly elections. But before that, he was an election commission, commissioner uh, in the multi-member, actually three-member election commission. Uh, before achieving that, I think you, a lot needed to be resolved, a lot of tensions, conflicts, and so on. But before we come to that, uh, we'd like to start out with the uh, implications of the constitutional status of the election commission of India. The uh, the, uh, in Article 324 of the Indian Constitution, the Election Commission has assigned the role of uh, su the superint superintendent's direction and control, not just of the preparation of the electoral rolls, but of the co conduct of all elections to Parliament and to the legislative assemblies of every state and of elections to the offices of the of the president and vice president held under the constitution. So how does the reality live up to or doesn't live up to the high constitutional status provided to the election commission of India and what are the gaps that need to be uh, filled before you can say the election commission is empowered not just in, on, on paper in article 324 but in reality to uh, fulfill its task of uh, superintendence, direction, and control of the whole electoral process in a manner that is worthy of in India's great democracy? I think to a very large extent. Um, uh, one might divide our electoral history into two portions, pre-session and post-session, for two reasons. One is that, as is widely acknowledged, Mr. Session, uh, whom I greatly admire, uh, gave teeth to the commission in a famous slugfest that he had with the then Prime Minister, Mr. Narasimha Rao. Which is not to say that all the election commissioners or chief election commissioners before Mr. Session hadn't contributed enormously. Because if this structure has been built, it's been built over 70 years, brick by brick, in that it is now a structure that is greatly admired by all electoral management bodies in all democracies in the world. So what, um, um, what for example, Mr. Sukumar, Su Sukumar Sen did for the first election of India, which stretched over 1951-52, is, is a task much harder than mine. Everybody contributed. And then over a period of time, the election commission, Ram, has become more and more independent so that today when an election date is set, we do not consult the executive. The prime minister does not know. The home ministry is not informed. So we do it as independently as that. Now, uh, you've done your own research, a real start uh, into the contribution of Sukumar Sen, who was an uh, officer of the Indian Civil Service, so the ICS, and then he made a move into the IAS, the Indian Administrative Service. 
how hard was it to find out uh, his real contribution? Could you tell us something? You did something what a which a journalist or a scholar would do, try to do original research. How did you do that? It's in the book, but most people haven't read the book. You know, Sukumar Sen is uh, the unsung hero of uh, Indian elections. Can you imagine yourself in 1951? First after independence, he is picked up uh, on Dr. B.C. Roy's suggestion to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and chosen because he'd always taken a very independent stand uh, even with his colonial rulers after he was a member of the ICS. Uh, and so he, he is appointed. But how do you begin to put together the first electoral role of India? I mean, it's much easier for me to get a role and then uh, in, uh, and tweak it to get in uh, um, uh, the, the additions and subtractions, as it were. But for the first person in an unlettered country with 16% um, literacy, female literacy even higher, and faced with a choice when he and his fledgling officers from the Constituent Assembly are trying to make a list, then three million women don't want to give their names because they are somebody's wife and somebody's mother and somebody's sister. So he refused to put them on the rolls till the 57 election when everybody gave their roles, uh, their names virtually. So he really had a huge task and he, I, tr I tried to research him like a cub reporter, uh, but he left no memoirs, he left no notes. Uh, I spoke to his two daughters, one in her 90s and one in her late 80s and pieced together what I could. Now, yeah, that's an interesting, the, the lack of records uh, by these men who are largely low-key. You are the fifth chief election commissioner to write a book. It started with uh, Session, and then T.S. Krishnamurti, uh, Lingdo, Mr. Lingdo, and then, of course, uh, Dr. Qureshi. Uh, how do you, what's your, uh, I mean, have you built on this literature, or is, is it your own distinctive uh, appreciation of the electoral process, both the challenge and the success in responding to it. How do, you, how do you evaluate, in other words, the preceding literature? I think it's all that you've said, but it's also my story. This is also my voice. This is my voice through five and a half years of understanding a very fine institution, but also recognizing the various fault lines that have emerged in money power and in muscle power and in fake news, and in paid news. So these are some of the negatives. But, but let's acknowledge that if we look around our neighborhood, of all the countries that got independence from colonial rule at about the same time, isn't it remarkable that in India, we're able to do our elections each time, on time, on due date, and even more remarkable, that the losers and the winners of an election accept the results equally. Sometimes I think that, that is the great strength. Uh, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating, isn't it? So that's the huge strength of how the election commission has got its act together. So, uh, so they accept it, but uh, usually blame the electronic voting machine. I'm sure there'll be questions about it, how foolproof it is and so on, particularly in the coming election, but I, I won't ask that yet. But uh, interestingly, your book is dedicated, and I quote, to the true heroes of the Indian election story, the thousands of dedicated polling officials, including teachers and revenue staff, as well as the police officials, all of whom walk the extra mile, I'm reading from your dedication, to enable the country to vote. The foot soldiers, in other words, so what's the story behind this unusual and moving dedication? You know, uh, we are a sum of many, many parts. Many of us sitting here are actually reluctant unless our car doesn't drop us to the election station. But may I tell you that how difficult it was to do elections in Naxal, India. Into the mic. How difficult it was to do elections in, the Naxal, in Naxal India, in mountainous India, in remote India, where are, how many of you have seen the film Newton? Will you raise your hands? Well, it's our Newtons who have to walk sometimes 
30 kilometers through a thick jungle which for various reasons has been mined uh, and people are blown up. And these are our young officials, presiding officers, our polling staff who have to walk much, much more than that extra mile. And you're one man electorate? And, uh, yes, uh, there is an, uh, the, 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 story, the, the reason why it's every vote counts is also because um, uh, in the middle of the Gir forest with all the lions roaming, the government of Gujarat some years ago decided that they had to relocate the village to a point of safety, which they did except for one pujari of a Shiv temple who said, I'm not moving. So the result of that is that twice every five years for an assembly election, and for the general election, a staff of eight people has to be sent there one day before they enter a forest lodge, they have to spend the night there, they open up on schedule at eight o'clock in the morning, and he saunters sometimes at noon, sometimes at three, sometimes at four, because every vote counts, and we can't close until he hasn't voted. So the story begins with him, but the story is also of this voter on the cover, if you, um, I don't know whether you can see that clearly. No, you probably yeah. can't, you can. but you, you can. can on the oh, you can there. So this is a wizened hand of perhaps a tribal lady who may have voted even in 1952, but she is still voting. So, so the book is ded to dedicated to these people. I'm going to pin you down on that title. Every vote counts. Do you really believe every vote counts or is it just a catchy title? Nothing wrong with that. Somebody, uh, a good title for a book because some votes could count more than others. For example, Muslims in uh, Uttar Pradesh or Bihar uh, or Kerala, I think they, they carry a certain weight uh, more than if, if they are spread out in some other state. So it's obviously not to be literally taken, is it? In a way, yes. Uh, how many people of you belong to, how many of here belong to Jaipur, for example, Rajasthan? Lots of hands. Now, you know the Rajasthan story. Um, if Mr. C.P. Joshi, who lost by one vote in 2008, if uh, I think his wife still feels sorry for the fact that she didn't vote that day because she was busy, but had she voted, then the history of Rajasthan's electoral history would surely have been a little different. But yes, in the other sense, whenever there have been riots, whenever there have been disturbances, whenever there have been floods or natural disasters, we have tried to reach, we have tried to reach every last voter. And there are other stories that I won't take up too much time, but I will, you should encourage them to buy the book, and then they'll come across a few more stories in that. No, there, there's a lot in the book on uh, the relationship between democracy and elections, where democracy has gone wrong. And this morning, you and I heard a very fine lecture uh, on uh, the coming of the Third Reich and certain comparisons that are made now with what's going on, the people who have huge, who score huge electoral victories and then move in an authoritarian direction, uh, who cut corners, who suppress democratic rights, uh, who fix elections, fix media coverage of elections and so on. So uh, where is India now uh, with respect to that question? Because there's a lot of complaint. we hear a lot of complaints about uh, the suppression of free speech, the lynch mobs, uh, you know, the whole, uh, uh, t you know, uh, tilting of institutions in a certain direction, including the CBI, the, the uh, and so on, income tax departments conducting selective raids. How does this all um, affect the conduct of free and fair elections? Because we are truly in election season. Mr. Ram is a cricket enthusiast and he has bowled me so many googlies that I am just thinking of what answer to give. But what I do want to say, if you ask me, what my main worry list and points are, then those are money and muscle power. Today we have a statutory limit, and we all know that that limit is, is exceeded by far. For a parliamentary election, the limit is 70 lakhs. And I met somebody who 
after I ceased to be election commissioner, said, do you know how much I spent? And I said, how much? And he said, I spent 50 crores on my election. A crore is 10 million for those who, uh, who are not from India. And he said, I'm not the highest spender. So-and-so spent 72 crores. Now, I ask you that we've become a sort of oligarchy. Our parliament consists of the richest people. Many of them are industrialists and businessmen. They find themselves on the parliamentary committees of exactly those places where there is conflict of interest. There was somebody who was put, now a fugitive, but who was put uh, on uh, the, the Ministry of Civil Aviation's parliamentary committee. And when I ask constitutional authorities why, isn't this an obvious conflict of interest? And they said, no, the answer is that he has domain expertise. So we are on the way to becoming uh, a rich parliament, a powerful parliament. But is this the voice of the people? Are those people who are now in our parliament actually representing the voices that Mahatma Gandhi felt at independence that they should represent? It's a question that I ask you all. If I might cite some uh, data, a study conducted by the Center of, for, for Media Studies, CMS, ahead of the 2014 Lok Sabha election, projected that political parties, candidates, and the government would spend an aggregated 30,000 crore rupees, that is 300,000 million rupees, on that, that, on that election. And a subsequent study done by the same organization, CMS, during the Lok Sabha election itself, estimated that the total spend on all elections between 2010 and 2014 over the, pa over the pre preceding five years uh, exceeded 150,000 crore rupees, half of which came from unaccounted money. Since the, now, does that sound uh, over the top? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think that it's... Uh, I mean, it is a guesstimate, but I don't think it's wildly off the course. There okay. is a huge spend. And, uh, and unfortunately, um, it's become uh, insatiable, even from the figures I gave you of, of somebody who spoke to me. So, th uh, so th there's, a, there's a big worry there. These points, uh, the figures given by CMS, which I've also come across, I don't disagree with them. I think that they're not, not too much off half the of, Half of the 150 crore, 150,000 crores estimated to come from black money. So the next logical question would be, natural question would be, how has demonetization affected this? Because now we hear that virtually everything, all the notes that were invalidated, the high denomination notes, have come back into the banking system and in recent elections, we found that political parties, but especially one political party ruling at the center, press reports suggest they have a lot of cash. Cash. Not, uh, not, was attempted, not what the demonetization attempted. How is that uh, magic possible? How do you invalidate notes and still man manage to retain uh, such large reserves of cash, which are deployed in elections to every, before everyone's eyes? Um, on uh, demonetization, clearly, all the experts tell us has not worked. It failed. Perhaps it had a political direction at that time. But all the money practically came back into the, into the banking system, into the exchequer. It was accounted for. But the, the worry point, as, which is uh, the, the underlying part of your question, is that... Um, that the money that comes in, the contributions that are made to political parties, uh, that mechanism has not been changed by any government. Whichever government comes, whichever government rules us, they all seem to need sources of anonymous money. So I won't pinpoint a finger at any one government. I'll pinpoint the finger at all of them. Every government. Including state governments. Including state governments. And, and, and look at the election law. What does the law say? 
the law says that if you contribute 20,000 rupees by check, that has to be accounted for by the political party. But if you give 19,999 rupees in multiples, then that is not accounted for. Now I ask you, when so many successive governments, why doesn't any government who says various things in opposition, and when they come into power, then why don't they amend the law? Now, we in the election commission have been writing for 22 years. You can all go on the net and see what our recommendations are. But does any government accept them? No. No government accepts it because it doesn't suit any government to accept it. Everybody, every government wants that money in cash, if possible, unaccounted for. And this recent business of electoral bonds, that was also a damn squib. In fact, it's turned out to be a greater method of camouflage from those interests who are contributing the money. So that is a huge disappointment that there's a sea of black money there irrespective of demonetization and irrespective of whichever government comes to power. Before I turn over the session to the audience, and there'll be questions, I'm sure, let me quickly mention the five reforms that you advocate in your book and in the chapter on electoral reforms that also relates to what's wrong with our democracy. So they, it's, it's, it's because the election commission is not an island. It reflects what goes on outside in society. Reform number one, pay, uh, purge criminality and tackle breaches of spending limits. I'm not going to ask for an, ex an elaboration of all this, but just pointing out the possible major areas for reform. Two, transparency of funding and, uh, funding and spending. Here I wish to point out that the present government changed the law the through the Finance Act of, 19, uh, of 2017 to make corporate don donations, uh, you know, uh, less transparent and more anonymous because now political parties are not required under the new schemes to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, corporates and, uh, and high net worth individuals are not required to disclose their identities. They can buy electoral bonds, which, is, which are like bearer bonds and deposit it into the designated accounts of political parties because these people, uh, we asked Arun Jaitley, the, fin the finance minister, why this? And he said that's because people are afraid of uh, revealing their identity. So that goes, that's a strike against transparency of funding and spending. Reform number three, making bribery in elections a cognizable offense. Reform number four, power to deregister political parties that do not contest elections. Because you explained to me earlier that they are a route to, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, money laundering, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and five, uh, Maveen, constitutional protection regarding the removal of election commissioners. There's no real time. You've got to read the book to do this, but I thought I'll flag these uh, major demands for reform, major issues, which uh, Naveen Chawla advocates uh, for reform. So if you want to make a quick comment on it, then questions. You know, it's a funny thing that if uh, you all get together and uh, you follow the basic rules to get a political party registered with the election commission, the election commission has no choice but to register it. But if you're using that money never to contest an election, but only to bankroll the money from black into white, the election commission does not have the power to deregister you. And we've been asking successive governments again for 22 years, and nobody gives this permission. On the other matter that you raised, uh, there are two points that I'd like to make because of paucity of time. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a very important, uh, a very important reform for the strength and the independence of the election commission lies in uh, the fact that the election commissioners must be appointed by consensus of the prime minister of the day, the leader of the opposition of the day, and perhaps the chief justice of the now day. they are appointed by the executive arm of government, the government of the day. And the government of the day does not want to take that, uh, doesn't want to 
um, do away with that power so it doesn't change this recommendation also because every government of the day wants to appoint its own election commissioner, hoping that that commissioner will continue to be loyal to that government. The second thing that I want to say there is that we have been writing for many, many, many years again, right from the time of, of Dr. M.S. Gill, uh, to say, to ask the government that, uh, that the two election commissioners must get the same protection that the chief election commissioner has. There was a time when there was only one chief election commissioner, and the constitution makers gave him the protection that is equal to the chief justice of the Supreme Court, that you cannot be removed unless you are not impeached in parliament, which means a two-third two majority of members uh, present and voting. So it was very, it's a very difficult thing to achieve. But why does the no government want to give the same power to the two election commissioners? So disappointingly, in a recent matter that was pending before the Supreme Court, a PIL, uh, the government filed its affidavit PIL that no, we are, interest litigation. We, we are happy with what, what, what's going on. Um, by way of fair disclosure, but I also, I, I greatly appreciate the chapter in the book where election commissioner, it's about election commissioner Naveen Chawla. There's an attempt to remove him. The chief election commissioner accuses him of bias towards the Congress party and tries to remove him. And fortunately for Indian democracy and for the health of the election commission of India, that was defeated. That was, that was not thrown out. Um, uh, again, uh, I figure in that because the, the media figures in that, but uh, you can make up your own mind. I think that chapter is quite important relating to what has just been brought out about uh, the elect chief election commissioner being the first among equals and the need for collegiality of the decision-making process uh, for, of this uh, high constitutionally sanctioned body. So I think that's, those are issues that are in the book. Uh, I, I really would like people, serious readers, to read this book carefully, along with all the literature that's been provided on Indian elections, on the great Indian election. But now, may we have a few questions from, uh, from you? Please keep the question short. We are running out of time. Thank you. Actually, you can. There have been some amendments recently, uh, and you're computer savvy. So if you could please download from the Election Commission website Form 6. Fill it up with your photograph and just put it on board. There's still time to vote from wherever you are in the coming election. But do hurry. So how many of you have confidence in the Election Commission of India? Those, how many of you have confidence in the Election Commission of India? What? So few hands? <laughs> yes, please. Mike? Pardon? What is it? Yeah. Electronic voting machine. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I have a chapter on the book on the EVMs. I call it the controversy that refuses to die. But but um, but even if you don't read the chapter in the book, take my word for gospel. Uh, I didn't see that London demonstration. I didn't even want to. Because uh, I know what the election and the EVM machine is like. May I give you a little history? In 2009, after I conducted the elections, the EVM was in July challenged by various interests. So we put together 100 machines in the election commission, which by the way was again done in, in June of 2017. 
and uh, uh, we invited everybody uh, to come into the election commission and consider that hall that we had as large as this uh, to be a typical polling station of India. And we said, please hack now. And we put cameras so that it could be admissible in evidence in a court of law. Well, no, well, people wanted to take the machine away, but even I can't take the machine away. The machine's IP belongs to two companies that manufacture it under great secrecy in the public sector in India. Now, our machine cannot be linked to your computer. It can't be linked by wire or wireless. It's, it's really like a pocket calculator, which is positioned to do some basic calculations. So I would request you all, and I want to take you to the fact that these machines have been through a long judicial journey. High Court in Kerala, High Court of Mumbai, High Court of Karnataka, Delhi High Court, Supreme Court, many judgments. So until a Supreme Court of India, in whom we all have faith, doesn't once again come to a conclusion that yes, the machine can be hacked, I would request that please keep your faith in the machine. And I'll end by saying one thing. It's the same machine that gave you same machines that gave you different results in UP from 2006 till now. Now, how can that machine give such different results? The machines, if they're tampered, they can be tampered once, but they can't be tampered. I think it's important to have this confidence and faith uh, because uh, we have all seen the evidence, many of us, Absol there's absolutely nothing to challenge the integrity and the uh, credibility of the uh, uh, electronic voting machines. I think we have three or four more minutes. I, I have a question. Pardon? I have a question. So, what do you have to say? Where are to you? Who? I can't. See. Where are you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. What do you What do you have to say to that section of the society, which is completely dissatisfied with the successive governments? And let's take an example of the society or a section of society which believes we have multiple gender-wise laws and they have been demanding that these gender-wise laws must be made gender-neutral laws. So now, successive governments are not listening to them and they think the only option they have is to vote nota. So what do you have to say to these people? One little thing that I do want to say is about the transgender, if I may. Uh, it was in um, Odisha and as it happens, uh, a week later in the Asian College of Journalism, which is run by the Hindu newspaper, that, uh, that students and journalists asked me about uh, why they have to be male and female, why can't we be gender correct and gender neutral? And I came back to Delhi and found that no law had to be changed. And so we changed it. So the columns became male, female, and it, it, in my time, I made it O for other. But it gradually, the High Court changed it to T for transgender. That, that was one aspect. The other aspect that I'd just like to briefly touch on is that the biggest disappointment of our political system is that political parties being completely patriarchal will not give women their due place in parliament. They deserve half the places. All they're asking for is one third, and they're not even getting that. And I think that you are important voices at the Jaipur Lit. I think you must write and petition the government of the day, because no government in any state, union or state, is wanting to make gender parity the way, the way it should. They're not even willing to nominate one third of the candidates even before the election, not even willing to nominate one third of the candidates as women. It's a shame. And on that progressive note, let us end this session. Thank you. <laughs>